Hi there. In this revision video, we're going to be looking at an aspect of oligopoly theory, and this is the kinked demand curve model. Before we get into the model, just a few words on the key characteristics of an oligopoly. This is a market structure which is dominated by a few large businesses, and we find in an oligopoly that there's a very high market concentration ratio. Typically, the leading five businesses in the industry together have more than 60% of the market share. Each firm supplies branded products, and there are barriers to entry and to exit, which means existing players can continue to earn supernormal profit. The next two points are extremely important. The key decisions taken by firms in the industry on price, on research and development, on the amount of marketing spent, those key decisions are interdependent. In other words, you have to think about the likely reaction of the other firms in the industry to a decision you take. Oligopoly is a very common market structure and my instinct is it's best defined by the actual behaviour of firms in the market. And the kink demand curve is just one model of oligopoly. There are several, but that's what we're going to focus on in, in this video. Here's a good example of a market which is oligopolistic. This is the market share for petrol in the UK in 2015. And you can see that Tesco is now the leading supplier of petrol in Britain with over 16% of the market. But essentially there are six firms there with more than 10%, each vying for your custom. And it's quite clear here that the petrol market in the UK is highly concentrated in the hands of just of a handful of big firms. And in a slightly different example, here's the global revenue in US dollars from the leading sports betting companies in the world. And again, you can see here that there are you know, between four and seven extremely big businesses globally in this fast changing market. There's two good examples of oligopoly. So let's look at the kink demand curve model. What does it mean? How does it work? And how do we build the diagram that can help you in your exams? Well, the kink demand curve model uh, assumes that a business might actually face a dual demand curve for its product based on the likely reactions of other firms to a change in its price or another variable. So a business in an oligopoly does face a downward sloping demand curve. That's pretty standard. But the elasticity of demand may depend on how the other rivals in the market respond to your decisions. Rivals are assumed in this industry, in this model, not to follow a price increase. So the acting firm, if they decide to raise their price, will lose market share. Demand will tend to be fairly elastic and therefore an increase in price may actually lead to less revenue. And rivals in this model are assumed to be likely, not certain, but to be likely to match a price fall by one firm. And they do that to avoid a loss of market share. Now, if all the firms in the market are cutting price together, then demand will tend to be more inelastic. And perhaps again, a fall in price will also lead to a fall in total revenue. Perhaps we should say at this point that the assumption is that firms in the oligopoly that we're looking at are looking to protect and maintain their market share. And this means that rival firms are unlikely to match another's price increase, but may match a price fall. So that's the assumption of the behaviour. Let's see how this works out in terms of the, of the diagram. Now, here's the way of building up the kink demand curve model. We have two demand curves, average revenue curves, AR1, which is fairly elastic, AR2, which is fairly inelastic. And there's a kink at the intersection between the two. So let's see how this works. The theory starts with the assumption that firms have settled on a particular price, let's say P1, P1 and Q. Q1 is the quantity. Now, we're not told why we start there, but oftentimes in the market, firms do settle on a kind of stable, acceptable price in the market. Now, what happens if the firm raises their price to P2? Well, the likely reaction of other firms is they will keep their prices as they were, because then that, that way they'll take some market share away from this firm. And uh, if the other firms hold their prices down and this firm raises increases to P2, 
they're likely to see quite a significant fall in demand. Sales will fall from Q1 to Q2, and you can show graphically here that the total revenue will go down. If uh, this firm decides to cut their price from P1 to P3, we assume the likely reaction of the other firms is to follow the price reduction. They want to avoid losing some market share. And in this situation, demand is likely to be more inelastic. It's going to be following AR2 rather than AR1. And again, there may be little benefit in terms of extra sales. And indeed, the total revenue, the total income for the business may actually fall. If we put the two reactions together, that so you have an elastic response to a price increase and an inelastic response to a price reduction, we get the idea of a kinked demand curve model. And this is the way that we can draw the average revenue curve in a kinked demand curve. Now, we don't necessarily have to stop there. That's the average revenue. But we might also want to just develop the analysis a little bit and think about the marginal revenue curve. Remind you that marginal revenue is the increase or the change in revenue from selling one extra unit. Let's take the fall in price at the top of the demand curve. Keep in mind that the marginal revenue curve here in the slightly darker orange color is always twice as steep as the average revenue curve. So that marginal revenue goes with the top bit. But actually in this model, if we go down to the second part of the average revenue curve, the, the slightly more elastic bit, the marginal revenue curve that goes with that will be discontinuous with the one before the kink. So this is how we draw the marginal revenue curve in a kinked demand curve model. Uh, don't worry, you won't be asked to prove this at all in an A-level exam, but this is uh, how it works. So we find at the vertical intersection at quantity Q1 here, the two curves do not actually intersect. The marginal revenue curve is discontinuous. So this is the essence of the kink demand curve model. And in fact, if we draw a marginal cost curve in there as well, uh, we may decide that there isn't actually a profit maximizing equilibrium unless we assume that MC1 has cut uh, the marginal revenue curve through the gap. One of the key predictions of the, demand, of the kinked demand curve model is that a business might reach a fairly stable profit maximizing equilibrium at this price and actually have little incentive to alter, to change their prices. Indeed, the kinked demand curve model predicts, and this is quite important for you, that there's, in this kind of market, there's going to be periods of relative price stability. Well, we call this price rigidity or price stickiness. In other words, prices stay fairly stable from where they've settled, even if there's a change in the cost of supply. Let's draw that in. I've shifted MC1 to MC2. Maybe there's been an increase in the cost of important components or maybe a higher minimum wage or living wage that firms have to pay. But hopefully you can see here that even this shift in the variable marginal cost of production doesn't necessarily cause a change in the profit maximizing point. So the King to Mark curve, in terms of an overview, um, in an oligopoly, firms have price set in, in this model, firms have price setting power, but actually because of interdependence, they may be reluctant to use it. They may be unlikely to match a price rise, uh, but actually quite likely to match a price fall. And if we settle on a particular price, there may be little, little incentive in changing the price, even if there's a change in costs. What this means is, and again, this is, the, this is an incredibly important point if you want to understand this model. If we have periods of relative price stability within an oligopoly, then businesses will tend to focus on non-price competition as a means of reinforcing their market position and increasing their supernormal profits. You can still get some intensive short-lived price wars in, in the kink to market curve model, firms trying to achieve a short-term advantage. But essentially, in this model, non-price competition becomes incredibly important. And we define that as any marketing strategy effectively to increase demand or develop brand loyalty. Here's some examples of non-price competition that you often see in these kind of markets. 
companies trying to be on the leading edge of, of innovation in terms of new product design and performance. Uh, great focus, particularly in service sector businesses, on the quality of service offered to the customer, including after sales. Things like offering uh, free upgrades to products which are not necessarily part of the original deal. Uh, allocating and creating exclusive um, and exclusivity for, for products and uh, loyalty schemes and loyalty cards etc are quite important. Fundamentally of course non-price competition is about the strength of and the quality of the brand and the goodwill that consumers have. And you can also bring in all kinds of different types of uh, competitive behaviour, free shipping, free packaging, that kind of stuff, all kinds of different sales promotions. The point to take from this slide, everybody, is that in the kink demand curve model, non-price competition becomes incredibly important in determining the market uh, performance of different businesses. So there we go. That's been a look at the kinked demand curve model. It's just one theory of oligopoly. There are others and uh, there'll be some different videos in this series so you can take you through the whole theory of oligopoly as part of your revision. Thanks for joining us and uh, see you again sometime soon.